This is a story of transition from the old to the new. It seems funny now, but it wasn't then. Each car was learning from its predecessor. This model, with its rumble seat in front, was a favorite at the turn of the century. The automobile, which at first had been only for the wealthy, was being priced within the reach of most American families. There still were mechanical headaches, but the auto was here to stay. Some of the miracles of petroleum are familiar to us all. Oil made possible one of the greatest inventions of history, the internal combustion engine. Americans were on the way to owning millions of cars, driving billions of miles a year. All these engines worked on the same basic principle of turning heat into work. But in each case, the amount of heat turned into work was small. The efficiency was low. Rudolph Diesel was certain that it should be possible to build an engine with a very much higher efficiency. 27%, far higher than any other engine of the day. But by far the most persistent dream of inventors has been to get something for nothing. No, Mr. Goldberg, not even your genius is equal to that task. You can't get something for nothing. You can't get power out of an engine without paying for it in fuel. <laughs> Folks, I've done it. It's one of the greatest inventions of all time more common than the personal computer or even the cell phone. It's the automobile, and since the turn of the century, it's a technology that humans have come to rely on like no other. There are 800 million vehicles in the world. By 2050, there will be two billion. The one I settled on way back in 1997 was this Volkswagen Jetta turbo diesel. It goes an amazing 950 kilometers on a single tank of 50 liters of diesel fuel. But even driving an efficient diesel car just doesn't cut it anymore. Not only are soaring fuel prices making it costlier to drive, it's also damaging the environment and causing potentially catastrophic climate change. We need alternative sources of energy, ones that are cleaner and less expensive than petroleum. Replacing fossil fuels and changing an economy based on them seems like an impossible thing to do, but I'm not afraid to try. My name is Noah Ehrenberg, and this is the story of my quest to drive smarter, cheaper, and hopefully for free. Man has discovered a virtually unlimited source of power. That source of power is gasoline. And the automobile engine is by far the greatest user of gasoline's power. The history of human ingenuity has produced many different kinds of engines and fuels to power vehicles. From steam heat and wood gas to vegetable oil and alcohol. Propane, electricity, hydrogen and solar, there's no shortage of ideas. Still, in most service stations in Canada, the choice is between two petroleum products, gasoline or diesel. Alternative fuels and the vehicles that go with them remain elusive. But there's now a team of Winnipeg scientists at the University of Manitoba aiming to change this. Uh, and he's also a grad student in biosystems engineering. David Levin and Richard Sparling are associate professors at the University of Manitoba. Sparling is in the Department of Microbiology. Levin is in biosystems engineering. Together, their combined research efforts are making headlines in the world of new fuel technology because they're making ethanol fuel from garbage. Agricultural residues, forestry residues, municipal solid waste like processed paper waste. The amount of garbage we generate is enormous. 50 to 75 percent of that, that garbage is waste processed paper materials. And if you could divert that into a biorefining process, you would have, you would alleviate that, that landfill issue 
and turn garbage into fuel. Yes, we can run the world on Tim Horton's cups as we run our lives on their Java. Look, here's something you throw away that you have in your hand every day. It has a value. So, so here's an example of uh, a cup. It could be a, a Tim Hortons cup or a Starbucks cup. And then we add the bacteria, and within a few days, the, the bacteria basically eat the paper material, the cellulose material, and turn it into mush and produce gas. And the, the gas contains hydrogen and CO2. And the, the, the water, the liquid phase, contains ethanol. In the U.S., 400 million tons of biomass are available at this time for biofuel production. So the question is, how do we go from this kind of uh, benchtop curiosity and scale it up into a bioreactor or into an industrial scale where it could actually be used to make usable energy? And what is the answer to that? How, how, how? Well, the answer to that is that we're working on it. We're working with two major organisms, one called Clostridium thermocellum, another one called Clostridium thermitidus. It may seem somewhat confusing to the layman. As I understand it, it's the rearrangement of the molecular satiforce and the canarine loss of celery. And you say the hydrocarbon comes into the vertebrates and brings out all the little high by two of celery and the cadre of hay. Then you said the hyperoid can raise the celery, bring the water sub the the right away the three, the composition going to the back, coming out of the center for of all the solar beaters. And that's why it can't force the hypercop and the cattle race will And they'll do it to you too. We work with bacteria that naturally degrade lignocellulosic material, biomass that in the environment. This is a pile of wood chips. So we, we isolate a, a wide range of different bacteria that can work together and and together have higher rates of breakdown of the cellulosic material and higher rates of product synthesis, whether that product's ethanol or hydrogen or, or butanol or even bioplastics. Well, this is where cutting edge is. Understanding at the gene level, at the molecular level, of how these bacteria tick so that we can actually make them do what we want to do. The research team has a grant worth $10.5 million from Genome Canada. Their focus, produce a drop-in fuel like alcohol-based ethanol to be used in gas-powered vehicles and make it from non-food sources. Brazil has been using ethanol as their major uh, transportation fuel for over 30 years. They currently use flex engines that can run on 100% ethanol one day or 100% gasoline the next day or anything in between. In Brazil, they produce their ethanol from sugarcane. Uh, in North America, we use starch-based, either corn or wheat. The bottom line really is that even if you converted all the farmland in Canada and the U.S. to producing corn for ethanol, you would only satisfy a fraction of the gasoline demand in North America. So we have to find other sources that are non-food sources, and so this is where our work comes in. Using designer bacteria that produce ethanol as they eat their way through Tim Hortons cups, might one day help me drive smarter and cheaper. In the meantime, even if I wanted to buy ethanol, such as E85, I couldn't because there are no pumps in Manitoba that sell this cleaner, cheaper fuel. It's time I looked at fuels that are available, like biodiesel. That's fuel made from vegetable oil for use in diesel engines. I've heard there's a plant in Arburg, a 90-minute drive north of Winnipeg. We were the first ones to make biodiesel in Manitoba. Paul Bobby started making biodiesel five years ago. And I moved 20, 30,000 liters to Manitoba Hydro. Hmm. So, um, from your backyard? From my backyard. And then talking to all these guys, you know what, this could be a good venture. Jeez, it almost killed us. So, <laughs> Paul Bobby's come a long way from cooking up homemade biodiesel. He's now one of 25 shareholders who own and run Bifrost Biodiesel, where Melvin Eilifson serves as president and Dennis Caprawi is past president. Their operation is just one of three biodiesel manufacturing plants in Manitoba. Here, they make the fuel from canola, harvested by local farmers who use the biodiesel on their farms and in their vehicles. Uh, pardon us, sir, but would you tell us what business you're in? Why, certainly, I'm a farmer. And uh, what do you grow on your farm? Well, you might say I grow automobiles. 
For this group, making biodiesel has been a steep learning curve. From deciding on the right equipment to buy, like these seed crushers, to figuring out the precise chemical process they need to follow. It's very intensive, work intensive. We'll bring in 800 liters at a time into this uh, preheat tank here. Warm it up to 50 degrees or so. Once it's reached that point, we'll transfer it to the reactor mm -hmm. and then refill the preheating tank so, so we do a continuous batch system. Okay. We'll throw it into our reactor with the catalyst of methanol and sodium hydroxide. Heat, heat all that mixture up to 90 degrees in the reactor, and then by that time, the reaction is complete. The reaction will take about an hour, and then it'll go through our final process of removing the glycerin. The biodiesel will go through our bead tanks, which will remove uh, impurities as well, and then, and then into the storage tanks. This is our finished product of biodiesel. Being able to make premium biodiesel has come after a lot of work and significant cost. The ventilation system alone cost us 45 grand. Really? Yeah. But they say it's worth it. Even blending in just 5% biodiesel or adding larger amounts in warm weather makes for less emissions, more engine lubrication, and money saved from buying less diesel. You're only adding a, a certain amount into your into your diesel fuels, like a percentage, so it's not that costly. And your engines will last twice as long. So if I blend 10% biodiesel in cold weather, and maybe even 90% in warmer months, I could buy a lot less diesel fuel. But how much would I be paying for this biodiesel? We're at, what, $1.50 a liter at the yes, moment? $1.53. Our production cost is around 25, 28 cents a liter. $1.53 a litre if I buy it here. Much less, of course, if I make it myself. But could I make it myself the same way Paul Bobby did in his backyard? Making biodiesel is not rocket science, but it's to follow the procedures and using the right equipment, it's easily made and anyone can make it. And they carry on their research and experimentation with the aid of the most modern scientific equipment available. If it's true that anyone can make biodiesel, I'm eager to try. And so is my cameraman, Bruce Little, who's much more of an armchair mad scientist than I am. I guess I'll put these on. According to our newly found fuel makers in Arburg, the biodiesel recipe calls for some methanol, as well as a catalyst like sodium hydroxide. Perfect for biodiesel, soap making, drain cleaner, and more. I wonder what more you can do with this. <laughs> <laughs> should always have one of these on hand, just in case. We carefully measure the sodium hydroxide and add it to the methanol, Pour that in there. which makes meth oxide. You need 3.5 grams of sodium hydroxide mixed with 200 milliliters of methanol for every liter of oil to be processed. Then we heat up some clean canola oil to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we put the heated oil into our homemade reactor. We need something to mix it with, like this cake mixer. And we start the process by slowly and carefully adding the methoxide to the heated oil inside the reactor. The methoxide breaks off the glycerin molecule, replacing it with a molecule of methanol. We mix this for an hour. Okay, so here it is. Our first attempt at making biodiesel. We can already see the glycerin starting to come out. Right. We let that sit for 24 hours. So we're gonna just remove the glycerin layer by draining it out of our little cap here. Right. Okay. Good. Well, there you can see the glycerin darker layer. There's the biodiesel right there. There's the oil, processed oil. One way to test the success of our chemical reaction is to wash it with water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me shake. 
Uh, yeah, looks like mayonnaise. Okay, well, doesn't look like it's separating that much. We figure the problem is with the quality of our meth oxide, as it probably absorbed too much water. Yes, a long way from the final product, but transition from the old to the new has begun. So here's our potassium hydroxide. Second attempt, we decide to use a better and slightly more expensive catalyst, potassium hydroxide instead of sodium hydroxide. And we measure and mix it all in an airtight bag where no moisture can get in. We repeat the same process as our first try, and hopefully our better quality chemical reaction will lead to success. Figure is shaking. Good wash. After 10 minutes, the water separates cleanly from the biodiesel. Hey, Paul Bobby, we've made our own biodiesel. Oh yeah, look at that. We'll dry it. Our last step is to dry it. So you just put them in the sun. Uh, molecules suspended in there that once the sun hits them, they will evaporate out and then it'll be clear like this one right here. So I can make my own biodiesel using regular canola oil, and I can blend it with regular diesel fuel, using as little as 10% in the winter and as much as 100% in the summer. Considering I'd still have to buy diesel at the pumps, and I'd have to put in the time to make the biodiesel, I don't think it's worth it, unless I can find a way to do it that's faster and cheaper. Oh, glad you're here. Come on, guys. Come on in and check out my setup. Our search takes us to this backyard in Headingley, where George Hill is making his own form of biodiesel using waste vegetable oil he collects from restaurants. Now, what I do to make my process even as simple as possible, because I, I like it to be simple and fast, and can I manufacture this in a couple hours and get on the road? Yes, I can. I find old T-shirts, get them given to me, or go to grad sales and get them for nothing, virtually nothing, or you get them at thrift stores. And this is the perfect filter. Once it's on, it's tight. It allows me to have this process. So having, set, having done that, your typical used oil, which I get given to me like this, many restaurants and some, some legions in Winnipeg, um, they, get, they call me and I pick it up. So I would take my oil, I used canola oil. It needs to be a canola oil, not canola shortening, by the way. Use canola oil. As I pour it, I can see it's transparent. Even though it's dark colored, it's transparent. If it's not transparent, I will stop using it. And at the bottom of a jug, often you get the sludge. And once I start seeing the sludge coming through, I will stop pouring it. And this, this, again, it's dark oil, but it's clear. Well, this is a pretty clean batch. The guy took care of this stuff. Just a couple little bit of french fries in the bottom there. Now this is, this is one of the items I put in. It's uh, diesel clean, um, power service diesel clean. But it's a cetane, cetane boost in it, which, which it's something like uh, cetane to diesel, something like octane to gasoline. This, this can cost about uh, $15. So I'll just measure approximately what goes in here, okay? But I would put close to a liter for 205, 200 liters of uh, fuel mix, okay? And that's my cost. Second cost is that I'm putting number one only gasoline here. So I want to put 5% gasoline. I, I always just guesstimate this looks like about two liters. I might put a little more. I don't think it hurts to put a little more of your gasoline in your system. Now, all I did is put gasoline, the diesel clean additive, and oil, okay? But the next, next process is, gotta mix this stuff up good. Some people use a big stick. I like using a paint mixer like this. I, go, I mix it both ways for a few minutes. Oh, that's not fast speed. George discovered this recipe on an internet site called Diesel Secret Energy. And I'll go around slowly and slowly. I'll probably do it for about up to five minutes. So my simple mechanism here is to turn on the power and let this start pumping oil into a jerry can. Using two pumps and two water filters, it takes George about an hour to mix and filter 50 gallons of his homemade fuel. There's only a few hundred dollars invested into this system and uh, up and running. I go by the diesel station and I just, I'll, I'll stop up and I'll say, oh yeah, I want 10 liters diesel, put it in, and that's it. And then the rest? Is, is my mixture already in the tank. And, and off, yeah, I, I like to run about 80% in my Jetta. 80% of this fuel, 20% diesel. That's where it seems to work quite well. 
it's just a safe mixture and I'll use that mixture down to about zero Celsius then I'll go to about 60 40 about minus 10 60 of vegetable 40 percent diesel about minus 10 minus 20 I'm down to about the other way about 40 percent vegetable 60 percent diesel about minus 20. When it goes really cold I get a very small amount in there. And even though he has to collect and filter used veggie oil, as well as buy additives like gasoline and cetane, and blend in diesel fuel according to the temperature, George figures it's still worth it. I do drive a lot. As, as an individual, I, I drive oh, well over 50,000 kilometers a year, yeah. and I'm trying to drive most of that on vegetable oil if I can. How much do I save? Well, I know I manufacture over 30,000 liters from this jug here. 30,000 liters. So if you say an average of a dollar a liter, then we've saved thirty thousand dollars over the last four years or so. I like to work with jerry cans like this size. They're so easy to pour. I very rarely spill, but I now and then you do. But putting George's waste vegetable oil blend straight into the fuel tank seems to work great. It's a faster and cheaper way to go. But is this too good to be true? I put that question to Frank Motors automotive specialist Dieter Schaffer. That's playing Russian roulette. One day, an expensive part on the diesel fails, like the injection pump, and most people go, yeah, it's worn out because I used it. No, it's worn out because you put contaminated fuel through, it wasn't at the right temperature, uh, injectors become damaged because pressures are too high, the fuel's not viscous, it's a crapshoot. The so-called jerk type pump meters an exact quantity of fuel, which is delivered at high pressure and broken into a fine spray at the injector nozzle. The development of precision airless injection was a landmark in diesel history. Putting waste vegetable oil through precision equipment like a diesel injector does sound risky. But according to the guys here at Frank Motors, there is a way to properly modify diesel vehicles to run on waste veggie oil using any number of kits that are commercially available. We ordered a kit, installed it, and lo and behold, some eight years ago, we had our first Volkswagen diesel powered by vegetable oil. We're now collecting roughly 30 to 35,000 liters a year of waste vegetable oil. We've converted approximately 40 vehicles over, and we run a fleet of five vehicles ourselves that uh, are used 80% of the time on straight, recycled, used vegetable oil. So I could convert a car to run on waste vegetable oil, but how much would it cost me? Well, the reality is, unless you're very good at installing one of these kits yourself, um, it's going to cost you anywhere between roughly $4,200 to $8,000, depending on which vehicle and how elaborate you want to get with an install. That's not too bad, considering I spend about that amount on diesel fuel every year. But is there a catch? Diesel engines, by the nature of construction, have no ignition point other than compression. Compression, ignition. Diesel adapted this principle to the internal combustion engine and described the cycle for the first time in 1892. That means that a diesel engine needs to create its own heat to be able to run. If you don't drive that vehicle into the operating zone for at least 15 or 20 minutes, if you aren't driving it long enough to get it hot, to be efficient, it's probably not the right car for you. For me, though, a diesel car converted to also run on waste vegetable oil seems to be the right system. Because I live 60 kilometers from Winnipeg, when I turn my car on, I drive for at least an hour, which is more than long enough to get the engine hot. And now that my Jetta is almost 15 years old, with nearly 600,000 kilometers on it, I'd say it's time for an upgrade. Maybe time to look at a newer car that I could convert to run on this inexpensive, efficient fuel. Well, here's a 2003 Volkswagen oh, yeah. Golf grease car kit installed. To my surprise, I find what appears to be the perfect vehicle, a 2003 Golf TDI that's been modified to run on waste vegetable oil. Firebird 2 to control car. We are about to take off on the highway of tomorrow. Stand by. I buy the car for $12,000, and because it comes with the grease car kit already installed, I figure it's a great deal. The conversion adds a second fuel tank to hold the waste vegetable oil, along with a heating system that is key to making it run properly. It even came with a full tank of veggie oil in it when I bought it. 
I just have to make sure the car is running on diesel when I start it up and when I turn it off. That's because waste vegetable oil gels up at cooler temperatures, so the only time I want it running through my fuel pump and injectors is when it's good and hot. And just as thin as diesel fuel. Uh, I'm driving for free. I can set the onboard control to automatically switch over to waste vegetable oil once the engine gets hot enough, or I can make the switch manually. It's a matter of having to understand the technology and being able to manage that. And that is not for everyone. Otherwise, what ends up happening is when you come out to your car, it's got vegetable oil in the lines, and the next thing you know, it's on a tow truck because it will not start. I figure if I want to stay off the tow truck, I better understand exactly how this unit works. In addition to its 50-liter diesel tank, another 50-liter tank has been added for veggie oil. The car's coolant system, which takes heat from the engine, is used to warm up the oil. The added tank fits in the spare tire compartment. I program the control unit to automatically switch over to veggie oil once the engine temperature hits 150 degrees Fahrenheit. I have to remember to flush the fuel system of all vegetable oil before I turn off the car. I program this purge cycle to run for 30 seconds. That's enough time to push diesel through the entire fuel system, ensuring there's no veggie oil gelling up the lines when the car cools down. Under the hood are two fuel valves, one for diesel and one for vegetable oil. And there's a heated veggie oil filter that needs to be changed regularly. There are people that hop in the car in the morning, they got two kids in the back screaming, they're running around, they got so much going on, they can't manage even the electronic system because they'll forget to push that one button at the end of the day. So that side of it is not for everybody. While it's not for everybody, it seems to fit for me. This car practically drives itself. I'll try it. I'd love to. How's that for magic? Smooth, man, smooth. My smooth new ride is running low, so I'm going to need some fuel real soon. I could buy veggie oil from Frank Motors for 72 cents a liter, but I'd like to save even more money and see how easy it is to collect it myself. I know waste oil is something that most restaurants give away for free because it saves them from having to dispose of it. How are you doing? I was looking for waste vegetable oil that I used to drive my car with. It doesn't take long, though, to figure out who I'm competing with when it comes to finding used vegetable oil. Oh, is that right? Somebody already comes and picks it up? Okay. All right, thanks for your help. There's those like me using it in a converted car, probably less than 500 people in Winnipeg. Yeah, we have been on that. Oh, uh, Rothesay yes. recycling? Yes. So you just dump it into the bin and then they take it away from you? Okay. Yeah. Rothesay comes in? Yeah. yeah, okay, all right. I'm also up against a recycling company called Rothesay owned by Maple Leaf Foods. They use it in some of their fleet vehicles, as well as ship it to the U.S. for livestock feed. So, lard. Oh, you use lard? Yeah. Okay. It's estimated there's about 3 million liters of waste vegetable oil in the province. About 70% of that, or about 2 million liters, would be in the Winnipeg area. And about a third of that wouldn't be suitable for fuel, either because it's animal fat or it's too dirty to be filtered. So that leaves about 1.3 million liters available for the taking in and around Winnipeg. There are trucking fleets that use more fuel than that, single standalone trucking fleets. So this is not a viable long-term large-scale project. So while there may not be enough waste vegetable oil to save the world, there's certainly enough for my car and an opportunity for me to kick my petroleum habit. I'm able to find several sources for waste veggie oil, and I soon discover the most economical collection points are those closest to my home in the interlake, as I burn less fuel to get there. All right, so in my quest for oil, I've come to this uh, back of this Chinese food restaurant in Gimli, and I'm gonna check to see uh, what sort of oil they've got. <laughs> oh, no, I don't think so. No. How about 
here. Oh, jeez. Oh, it's all congealed. I don't think we're going to be taking this oil here. I don't even know if it is oil. I quickly realized the importance of finding restaurants that change their oil frequently, so it's relatively clean and not as acidic as an oil that's been fried way too much. Like the best filleting, like you can't fill any bones here. I just flour it, dip it in the batter, throw it in the fryer. I use canola oil. Always, always, always canola oil. I figure it's the healthiest. I'm not going to use lard and I don't want to use peanut oil because so many people are allergic to peanut oil. Nick Badger, who owns and operates this popular eatery in Gimli, says he keeps the oil in his fryers clean because it makes for better tasting food. Filter it every single day. That way it doesn't burn as fast, get as dark as fast. It keeps it uh, clean. Nice product. The fish does take a little bit longer to crown up because the oil's so fresh. I can fit like 48 pieces of fish in here. Looks good. What's the temperature of that oil? Uh, the fish I usually do about 375. We do have five fryers. We got two just for potatoes. We got one just for the chicken. And then we got two for the fish. And everything's not going in the same, same pot type deal. Looks like I found a good source of waste oil. Not only does Nick do a lot of frying, he changes the fryer oil frequently. Pop this in like this, and then... It all depends how busy it is. If it's really busy, I'll have to empty it more often. I usually don't let it go longer than a week. So that's that. I just empty it into the box, and I pop it out the back door and wait for guys like you to pick it up. Well, it's better for the environment than using gas. And I think, uh, slowly but surely, we're going to find a different alternative to gas, be it vegetable oil, be it something else, but uh, better, than, yeah, better than burning gas. Good deal for me, as three of these jugs will fill my tank. But I'll need to find more, and I soon discover that some collection points are less convenient than others. Like down the road in Winnipeg Beach, at another popular eatery that knows how to fry it upright. All right, so here we are at Salty's restaurant. Very good oil, but it's in containers, so I'm gonna be dipping for it. And uh, I guess I'll get dressed to do that. Today, the driver of the motor car doesn't get something for nothing. I'm ready. Ooh, it looks like nice oil, too. Yeah, there's gotta be a better way. I think a pump into the back of my car. French fry there. That's one. Put a bit on that guy. Put that in there. Oh. And let's make some fuel. Now that we've got some oil, the next step is to heat it and filter it. Our available supplies of fuel now do more work with increasing efficiency and economy. How much oil are we going to make uh, to start with? Probably about 100 liters, I think, of oil is what we'll filter today. The oil. It took me about an hour to collect 100 liters of oil, and it will take about another two to three hours for me to filter it. After doing some research online, I decided to go with the most inexpensive and rudimentary of filtering systems. Looks pretty clean. The first thing I have to do is heat up the oil, and an open fire is the cheapest way for me to do that, as I have a lot of firewood. What's our uh, desired temperature? Our desired temperature is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or 100 degrees Celsius the boiling point of water because we don't want any water in the oil. All right, make sure everything that you're using is clean. I'm using some plastic containers that I had lying around and six bag filters of different sizes that I bought online for about $3.50 each. There's three filters here, 100 microns, 50 microns, 25 microns. And then the next set 
10, 5, and 1 micron. Heating up the oil not only helps get rid of any water, it also makes it thinner. This allows the oil to flow easily through the polyester filters, which can be reused many times. Filtering catches just about everything, from a large speck of dirt to a tiny particle of flour. Whoa, he seems to be stuck. Must be a bit of dirt clinging to him. But as soon as it comes off, he'll get through all right. There, he made it. And now we're gonna go and put it into, through the other set of filters. While this process is relatively easy and inexpensive, it's still labor intensive, time consuming, and a bit messy. And there's no way I'm doing something like this outside in the winter time. Using waste vegetable oil in an automobile seems bizarre. Pretty hot. But it's not that unusual if you consider the invention of the diesel engine in 1893, which was originally designed to run on plant oil, not fossil fuel. The diesel engine came about in the early 1900s and it was never designed to run off petroleum based. It was designed to run off of peanut oil. So the reality is this is not new technology, but it's a new concept. The modern diesel, the most efficient and most versatile of all heat engines. And now it's ready for storage. So the question is, is it worth all this effort? I must admit, it doesn't seem like work when I imagine using waste vegetable oil instead of buying regular diesel fuel at the gas station. For the cost of a few rags and uh, some filters and my time and a little bit of effort, like fuel for free. Or is it? Those are heavy. Now, some would argue that if you personally go and collect the fuel and you have a rudimentary system at home that there is no cost to doing that. My free time has a cost to it, and you've got to be realistic. So here is the veggie oil fuel tank, which is where the spare tire used to be. Filling up my spare fuel tank with waste vegetable oil makes me feel good because it replaces 50 liters of diesel fuel. That's about $65 at the pump that I would have used if I didn't have the veggie oil option. But while it's exciting to collect and process my own fuel and fill up my car with it, I still need to find an easier and more efficient way of filtering it. Hey, Noah, good to see you. Good to see you too. Nice to see you. How are you doing today? Very to my well, surprise, my own neighbor, Lenny Raychuk, is also burning waste vegetable oil in his vehicle. There's my vehicle, 1992 Mitsubishi Pajero. Yeah. Lenny is a creative, resourceful kind of guy. So this is the first stage. When I get the oil from various locations... Evident from the system he uses to clean the oil. It comes and you get French An innovative in there, patchwork of filters he's collected over the years. So a lot of times you, you need a first stage and you need it to get all the big stuff. And then slowly you work your way down and, and go smaller and smaller. That brings it down to at least five microns. This is from a swimming pool. Silver one from the dump. <laughs> it's just an uh, old strainer from years ago. Let me just get this flowing through here. Once Lenny pumps the waste vegetable oil through this series of homemade filters, Oops. he sends it through the strangest filtering device in this free fuel fun house. Automatic juice extractor. It's a centrifuge and it yeah, spins around and it, it, it throws the, the oil out and captures the dirt and puts it to the other pulp pickup area. Okay, I can show you what dirt comes out of it and all the particulates, even salt from the french fries it'll pick up. It's phenomenal, it works really well. People wouldn't believe it, but it does, yeah. So as fast as you can make juice, you can drive your car. The, the one on the left is straight out from collecting it, and uh, the one on the right has been filtered through the uh, centrifugal uh, juicer uh, two times. Now we pour it in a tank and we can go. <laughs> mm. 
Lenny paid $2,000 for his waste vegetable oil kit that he bought from a Canadian company in British Columbia called Plant Drive. So basically, uh, all I have to do is push the button, and within a few moments, it will be running on veggie. And actually, it runs much quieter when you flip it over onto veggie. And it smells nice when you're driving it. Sometimes it's like donuts, cinnamon donuts, or french fries, <laughs> or barbecue. It depends on where you get your veggies, veggie oil from. Where do you get your oil? Uh, local places, golf courses, you know. Uh, mom and pop places. You need smell o vision. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can smell the nice french fries. So you purge the system by flipping it over. And that runs the uh, vegetable oil out of your lines and replaces it with diesel. So it, in here I have, uh, I welded up my own uh, aluminum tank and uh, the materials were pretty inexpensive. This tank is uh, 100 liters. This is a, the final heater, and it will take uh, vegetable oil that is 60 degrees and heat it up to 160 degrees, which is what is required to run your motor efficiently. The first one here tells me that uh, that's a temperature at the filter, and the other one tells me what the temperature is in the tank. I installed it myself. Uh, it took me a, like, a good part of the weekend, but if I could do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> yeah. For a do-it-yourselfer like Lenny, there's no question that the time he spends collecting and filtering the oil is worth it because of how much less diesel fuel he has to buy. Fill the truck up once, and I would have that diesel all summer into the winter. And, basically, and just run for free, drive for free. How good is that? What more do you want out of life? <laughs> what a country. I can drive my car for nothing. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. very good. Yeah. Take care. It may seem that using waste vegetable oil is not that common, but to my surprise, there's a much bigger community out there than I expected. I soon come across this rig operated by Green Kids, a nonprofit environmental educational group. The touring acting troupe converted this 1990 Power Stroke van to run on waste vegetable oil to reduce their travel costs. Really switching from diesel to veggie oil, I don't even notice the difference. There's it didn't take way. long for Daniel Tao Eloff to learn how to operate this vehicle. He's the driver and road manager for this group that takes their environmental message seriously as they visit schools across Canada. It's about 10 minutes that it needs to run before I can switch it over. Uh, for really short trips, I can't, but if we're driving half an hour, even in the city, I'll be running most of that time on veggie oil. We do a lot of touring to the schools all over the country, and instead of renting a vehicle or buying you know, a non-eco-friendly vehicle, we decided to, uh, to buy this bus and convert it into a motorhome and convert it to run on straight vegetable oil so that we could reduce our footprint and save some money at the same time. As volunteer president of Green Kids, Jeff Golfman oversaw the green conversion of this vehicle, from the non-toxic materials used on the interior to the solar panels on the roof to run the electrical, and of course, the addition of a waste veggie oil fuel system. The first thing at conversion we had to do was add two new fuel tanks underneath the bus. Uh, we kept the diesel fuel tank that came with the bus and then we added two more to give us several hundred liters of uh, veggie oil capacity which allows us to go you know, more than a thousand kilometers of driving without uh, refueling. And then in addition to that, we also have a couple uh, 50 gallon barrels that we carry around with us in the back of the truck with more veggie oil in case we run out. So um, we can go for very long distances without having to stop for, for oil. This is really cute. When the green kids show up at a school in the bus, they're like rock stars and like uh, they just get, you know, the schoolyard, they get very busy, everybody just like rushes to the bus and is very interested and keen and so uh, people are very excited. You know, the concept of not having to drill for petroleum um, and, and use a non-renewable resource is very appealing to people and so there's been a very positive reaction to running straight vegetable oil. We're the green kids. This is Evan Flo. Enjoy. 
know, through our actions, not just with our words, you can make a positive change. And so using a vehicle that's running on straight vegetable oil um, that is not impacting the food supply, um, such as other fuels, and is not taking a non-renewable resource out of the earth like traditional uh, fuels, we're showing people that it's possible and we're hopefully inspiring kids and future generations to also look that way. You associate moving a giant vehicle like this with burning fossil fuels. And uh, right now we are moving this vehicle at almost 100 kilometers an hour down the highway and we are not burning fossil fuels right now, which is neat. Designed and engineered for the spell of the open road. The goal to burn less fossil fuels seems to be the motivation that drives those who use waste vegetable oil instead. You can find small pockets of these resourceful, money-conscious Winnipeggers in neighborhoods Hi. across the city. Hi. I'm Noah. Hi, Noah. I'm Ken Heinrichs. Ken, this is Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Hi and the more people I find doing it, the more ideas I get about making the process more efficient and cost-effective. Well, we're just in the process of uh, setting up a centrifuge system to uh, clean our veggie oil. And once we get the oil, we pour it into here. Then, then all the, the crap kind of settles at the bottom. And then we just go like that. We do that a couple of times, let it sit there for a day or two. So then we'll take and we'll pump it out of here uh, with this pump into this barrel and we heat it up to about 150 degrees with a barrel heater. This is brand new, we're just hooking it up. We're hopefully we're gonna have this thing up and running today. The oil comes, the oil comes into here. It's gonna leak into here, spin around. They said it's supposed to do about uh, 20 gallons an hour. There we go. And it's variable speed. For Ken Heinrichs, spending a few thousand dollars on this kind of detailed setup pays for itself. Well, I've been doing it for three years now. I, for sure, I've, I've saved 25000 in fuel. Yeah, absolutely. Come on downstairs. Ken not only powers his vehicles with vegetable oil, but also heats this building with a furnace designed to burn veggie oil. Put a little oil in here and just make a little fire. And once you've got it warm, this thing will automatically, the fan will come on and it'll shoot oil into there. Here's a little motor in here and it'll shoot the oil in here. We use about, I would say, um, two of those jugs in a, in a 24 hour period. Wow. And this room will heat up to about 120 degrees. It's got a fan and we just take and push all that hot air up there and it heats the whole building. Back upstairs, Ken's son-in-law, Dave Pankel, and his brother, Chris Pankel, are busy working on a diesel truck that Chris just bought, converting it to run on waste vegetable oil. For these guys, the challenge is keeping the waste veggie oil hot in Winnipeg's cold climate. It's why Chris will put the veggie fuel tank in this insulated box and do a few other cold weather modifications. The system that I'm using for this truck is a, it's a golden fuel system and they're out of the States. I, I just ordered their kit off the website. Because it's cold, I have to uh, run on diesel until the engine warms up, and then I switch over to vegetable oil. Then there were other aspects. For example, trucks fitted with high-speed diesel engines may have to work in regions with temperature well below zero. So I attach this box to my truck, and uh, I'm gonna feed my lines into the engine from the engine into the fuel tank. So there's an actual tube that goes through this fuel tank that keeps the fuel, that heats the fuel as you're running the vehicle. So this here is the filter that, that all the fuel runs through. So in here, I have a heating disc inside here that, uh, that as soon as I turn on the engine, that disc starts heating up and starts heating the oil that's in here. When is a challenge, yeah. I mean, it would be great to run the system if you lived in Arizona or something, you know, you could probably just... You could probably just put vegetable oil in your fuel tank, yeah. you know? Right. Yeah. Fill her up with SO Extra Gasoline. 
the gasoline that stops cool weather stalling. Chris paid $1,500 for this kit, and he'll spend the weekend installing it. What's most evident here is how all this tinkering seems easier and more enjoyable when a few people work at it together. Uh, my brother Dave actually got me involved with vegetable oil, and so when he did it, uh, we had a lot of success. It just, uh, his father-in-law got really excited about it, Ken, and my brother Mike got into it, I got into it, and then, so now we kind of have this little pool of people who run vegetable oil, and hence we have this, this crazy laboratory here. And, you know, it, it works great for us. Yeah, it definitely saves money. Um, Especially with the, uh, the van, we had a, uh, a passenger van that we used for the business. And um, I mean, we got over 200,000 kilometers on vegetable oil. And so when you think about those kind of kilometers for elbow grease, it's a lot, you know, it makes it viable. So, and then you got guys like Kelsey, he's got the Delica, which is outside, who, you know, come by and we sell them vegetable oil. And there's a few other people who come by that we, supply with vegetable oil and it keeps the shop running and uh, it sort of, uh, you know, helps out. It's hard not to get the feeling that there's a thriving community of like-minded people all wanting to drive as far as they can using as little petroleum as possible. Like these folks who are about to drive their Mitsubishi Delica from Winnipeg to Whitehorse burning mostly the waste vegetable oil they're picking up here. It's these kinds of savings that's inspiring Dave Panko to take his knowledge of waste veggie oil to another level. I'm the special projects manager here at the fort. So I'm uh, running their Target Zero program. Right now we're trying to convert all our vehicles to run on waste vegetable oil. We're trying to compost all our waste, uh, recycle all our materials, and um, you know, just reuse what we can and sort of close the loop here at the ports. We collect all the used vegetable oil generated uh, from the market. So all the vendors in the market give the maintenance guys a call. They come with pails, collect it, and then pour it inside a, a tote, which gets transferred over to our processing plant. And there it gets filtered, and then we use the end product in our vehicles. Right now, we'll get about 1,100 liters a month over the summer months when the forks is busiest. The success Dave Panko has had using a centrifuge at his own shop convinced him to go with a similar oil filtering process here at the Forks. We put through the stuff that we were filtering with just through a regular filter through the centrifuge and the centrifuge is you know, what we used to consider clean, put that through the centrifuge and it gets even cleaner, you know, so that we know it's taken out a lot. Next, I'm just going to plug in the heater here. Dave has made the process even more efficient here at the Forks by adding a small 1500 watt bolt-on heater that heats the oil instantly and saves the energy it would take to heat the whole drum. In addition to using waste veggie oil in their vehicles, they also use it to power this refrigeration trailer that stores the market's produce. Forks saved about $13,000 by running it on that on the vehicles and equipment, saved about 10,000 per year, yeah. Wow. Today, the automobile is part of any American scene. Every man, woman, and child in America could go riding at the same time. And if we wanted to, we could all ride in the front seat. In my quest to drive smarter and cheaper, I've discovered there's money to be saved using waste vegetable oil. And while I'm not driving entirely for free, it's proving to be the most economical option for me right now. Others have found this too, whether it's someone in their backyard, or a cooperative of people, or even a marketplace or small community. It seems to make good economic sense, especially if you're filtering the oil efficiently. But beyond the savings, I've also discovered a real movement away from fossil fuels, a sort of collective realization of the road that ultimately lies ahead for all of us, 
whether we like it or not. We were pretty well facing, I think, one of the greatest challenges as a species that we've ever faced. The population of the planet is going to reach 9 billion people by 2050. We're also past peak oil, and add to that the global climate change issue. We have to deal with it, and continued and increasing combustion of fossil fuels contributes to the carbon in the atmosphere and exacerbates the problem. We can get off of so many of the things that we're doing right now that clearly aren't working. Um, oil is one of them. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it's a keystone issue for us for the future of the planet. And I really believe that if people started making a change, then we would all benefit long term. And, and it might even come down to the survival of the planet itself. To me, I think what the alternative fuels are about is more thinking outside the box. It's learning to think in alternative ways that's as much a part of this as the actual veggie oil bus itself. It's about individuals making an individual choice. So if we make decisions to go veggie oil fuel or to you know, use our vehicles less, that will make a huge impact. And if eventually enough people are making those changes, then significant changes will, will come into place. Designers are getting these dreams down on paper. Is this the car? Is this what it will look like? I imagine that many years from today, when we're all driving super efficient vehicles using some inexpensive futuristic fuel, we'll look back at the first decades of the 21st century as the point in history when the alternative fuel revolution began. And an oddity like a car that runs on waste vegetable oil will be just one of many artifacts that document our drive away from fossil fuels. If we plan for the future, if we look ahead to clear all obstacles and roadblocks, if we recognize the importance of this great individual freedom of movement, the motor car will be the key to our ever-widening horizons of tomorrow. You know, I saw on the internet a way we can make your car run at least 20% more efficient. Really? How's that? It's called Hydrogen Boost. This is our homemade hydrogen cell. But basically a 4-inch PVC tube. Inside here we have 16 stainless steel switch plates uh, just on a, a rod coming up to these two posts. Inside here is just uh, water and a little bit of sodium hydroxide. just put some power to it. I just modified this old computer power supply to give us 12 volts, 20 amps, so it simulates what our car battery is going to do. So you can see around here, you can see the, uh, the hydrogen bubbling up through our bubbler. You know, as long as the hydrogen bubbles up through water, because if there was ever a backflash, this would stop the flame from going back inside the cell and uh, exploding it. All right, so let's test the potency of our hydrogen, shall we? Ready? Okay, right. I'll let you do that. Woo! So next up, into the car. 